Welcome back to another another edition of the Big Nick Energy Podcast. I have a return guest. We talked to her earlier in the season, actually in the preseason, to do, do a Knicks Raptors preview. And the biggest thing happening at the time was a lawsuit, which is still happening, but that did not stop the Knicks and Raptors from doing a blockbuster trade within the same division, no less, which I'm pretty sure Messiah Jerry is the only GM in the league that doesn't care what division the team's in. He's going to make a deal if he likes it. Iman Adan, how are you doing again? Good to have you back on. Yeah, thank you for having me back on. Uh, it's it's good to be here. There's, there's trade talks. That's fun. There's not even trade talk. There's a trade. It actually happens. That's true. That's true. Which, as a Raptor fan, that's very rare for me. Yeah, oh, no, yeah. Nothing you've <laughs> ever been used to. Maybe not in the past couple of years. The past couple of years outside of Jakob Bertel, he's like, should I hang on to everyone the whole time? Will they all willingly stay here? Oh, <laughs> damn. I lost Fred Van Vliet. I lost Kyle Lowry for pennies on the dollar. So the Kyle one, we all saw <laughs> coming. That was just a favor to Kyle. But yeah, the Fred Van Vliet one hurt. And, and now we're seeing, you know, the side's not going to make that mistake again. This, in essence, has the remnants of the Kyle Lowry trade because that's how you guys got pressure to shoe in the first place in 2021. So. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here, since you you do cover Yahoo Sports Canada, do you you still do uh, the pros and claws around Raptor Substack occasionally? Do you still do the uh, the podcast you were doing? Because I know you said you were an offer a little bit. Yeah, so we had a hiatus. We came back with an episode that is going to be one part of a larger series where we uh, got to interview Tim Donahue. I was uh, sick. Yeah. <laughs> For those of you guys who don't know, Tim Donahue, a uh, convicted criminal, um, was the the referee who got um, who was was betting on games. Uh, so we got to, we got to interview him. So that is out on the Dishes and Dimes Network. And I didn't want that to be a standalone episode because um, we maybe shouldn't just trust the word of a convicted felon <laughs> <laughs> on his side of the story for all of it. So uh, we want to work with Tim Livingston. We've got something there in the works for part two. And and yeah, we want to do a broader series on things like that. So that's coming out uh, in, in 2024. That's really sick. Make sure to use subscribe to the Dishes and Dimes podcast network everywhere you can, because that sounds awesome. Yeah, check it um, out. It's out now. So yeah, let's yeah, definitely go listen to that right after this. Iman, let's just dive right into it. Your initial reaction. You're a Raptors fan. You cover Yahoo Sports Canada like you traded away. One of the most prime the prize possessions the Raptors have had in years, an OG and an OB. Lesser to extent, Precious to Chew and Malachi Flynn. No offense to those guys. Precious is going to be really big for our rotation personally. But what was your initial reaction when you saw this happen Saturday? Um, I was sad. It was, it was so funny because I got messages on both Twitter and my phone saying, what do you think of the trade? With no mention of what the trade was. So I'm like, what trade it? Um, but immediately I, I was like, okay, it must be OG because it, to me, an OG trade was pending. It made the most sense. Uh, as you mentioned, the Raptors lost Fred Van Vliet for nothing last season, but OG has, there's been a lot of talk about him wanting a larger role uh, in the Raptors offense. And if you go through their touches this season, you will see that not only does he not have a larger role, he's gotten a smaller role from where he was uh, just a year ago. So um, when, when all that noise existed, it made sense that he was going to, I didn't think the Raptors had a chance to really keep OG and Anobi. I love OG. Um, to me, like he's Masai's most prized possession. I and Precious Achua might be number two. Sorry to Pascal Siakam, but those might be his <laughs> number one and number two most prized, not just because of the Nigerian connection between all three of those men, but um it's it like Masai loves loves OG and he loves Precious Achua. So it was it was surprising on that front, but I, to me, OG needed to be traded. It it was the only thing that made sense. There was no real future here. He's going to command a really big paycheck. And I, I don't know that he fits what the Raptors need because what the Raptors really need right now are floor raisers because their floor is so bad. And what I think OG Ananobi does so well, is he's a great ceiling raiser. Yeah. And the Knicks have a much better floor than the Raptors. The Knicks are looking for ceiling raisers. And to me, this is like one trade amongst many for the Knicks. Like, it's not surprising to me that they still have Evan Bournier on the books and that he wasn't included in the trade because they still need big money. They still got all of their first round picks, right? So looking at the trade details, it all made sense to me. And the Raptors needed to move off of OG Ananobi. I also not surprised that it's the Knicks with the CAA connection there with OG Ananobi. Uh, you know, his agent being the son of Leon Rose. Um, so <laughs> We're it, all so it well aware. <laughs> it, it made sense. Uh, I was not surprised, and I honestly am pretty happy about it because OG 
has looked kind of listless this last few weeks. Like I know a lot of Knicks fans are probably looking at, um, you know, his stats this season and are kind of underwhelmed. I'm going to be honest. I don't know if there's like an injury or if he was checked out or anything like that, but OG at the start of the year and OG in the last month, I think has been a different player. So to work off of that, because you said one thing that was actually, no, it's okay. You said one thing that like we've all known and caught the attention of, OG switched to CAA um, in what the off season or right at the beginning of the season. Yeah, so his agent was with Clutch. His agent is now with Fan Sports, I think, or Fanatic Sports. Uh, so his agent is no longer a player agent. So OG was in the market for a player agent, and it was CAA. So, so between the Knicks signing Dante Divincenzo, right? Like they mm-hmm. signed him for the mid level exception in the off season. He's basically he basically plays the quickly role of combo guard, off guard. He has the Villanova connection, which means no matter how much Knicks fans love Emmanuel quickly, Dante DiVincenzo started out in the inner circle for something that Emmanuel quickly would have to work towards getting. And OG and Anobi changes from clutch to CAA within like a two month time frame. So those two dominoes were the biggest pieces that actually led to led to this originally. How surprised are you that this actually happened with this lawsuit that's still ongoing for some reason? Because this was allegedly going to be a thing uh, potentially a year ago. They, the Raptors wanted more. They didn't They didn't go for the three first-round picks. They didn't go for the Knicks package then. Now everyone thought this is going to be off the table entirely because of this lawsuit, and yet here we are. Yeah, I honestly never really believed the noise about the three first-round picks, which I know sounds insane to everybody. For one, the the amount, uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit, I'm assuming. But uh, just to answer your question here, I'm not all that surprised. I think maybe if I were a Knicks fan, I would be because to me, and you guys, you can tell me if, if this is different to you. It means that Dolan is not as involved in the basketball operations as maybe he once was. And he's actually given the reins to, um, you know, Leon Rose and, and company there. That's what that reads as to me, which is, what I mean, based on the fact that the Knicks are a competent basketball team, seems to be the way things are turning. But um, yeah. So to me, that's because like everything that I've read about the Raptors lawsuit, it also includes like you know Dolan taking a step back from you know duties within the uh, board of governors and all these other things, and his you know beef with Larry Tannenbaum, uh, the Raptors owner, and and Masai Ujiri. And so to me, it's just like okay, this has nothing to do with, however petty james Dolan wants to be over anything yeah. and is about basketball and so you just you know you let the adults do the work and the trade happens uh, james Dolan's actually been less involved since right before he hired phil jackson like that's when oh. he actually stopped getting as involved he just started with like a terrible hire he started <laughs> by and convincing a guy that did not want to be in new york city or did not do the job whatsoever to move out of smoking weed in montana for like 50 but mil or whatever it was. I don't know if was. the Raptors were trading with the Knicks back then. I feel like, I feel like that still James Dolan, because Dolan has said he does not want to trade with Masai Ujiri anymore. Those were things that happened. I mean, he's here. scared from Andre Bargnani. A Kyle Lowry <laughs> deal was nixed because of this. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I just, I, I think it means that like, I don't, I don't know that Leon Rose cares about any of that. I don't think Masai, Masai Ujiri definitely doesn't care about any of that. So no, yeah, not, not. not totally surprised. <laughs> That's fair. Here, I know, so we're going to talk about OG, RJ Barrett, and Emmanuel quickly, realistically the most. Uh, so I wanted to start real quick, just because Malachi Flynn and Precious Achua are also a part of this deal. Um, starting with Malachi Flynn, because he's probably going to have the smallest role in New York. Um, six foot one, six foot three wingspan, 25 years old. He's the 29th pick in 2020, went four picks after Emmanuel quickly. Uh, more painful for Raptors fans. He went one pick before Desmond Bain, which would have been really nice probably to have. Um, so he's actually, his averages all went down, or have all been down this past year. His minutes are down this past year. He's down to like, what, 15 minutes a game right now? So what has Malachi Flynn done or not done in the past two or three seasons that's made his role diminished? And from being a potential backup point guard in the NBA at one time to being a fringe rotation player? Um, His role has actually increased this season way more than it ever has. <laughs> Um, it, the minutes changed, but what, what was he playing? Like I, there was, it was garbage. It was garbage minutes before, um, Nick nurse 
<laughs> Nick Nurse and, and Eric Flynn. You guys will, will become uh, acquainted to Eric Flynn, Malachi Flynn's father. Um, not huge fans of each other, I would imagine. But um, no, so <laughs> Malachi Flynn is just, he's he's small. And, you know, the reason why the Raptors passed up on Desmond Bain was because of that negative wingspan, you know, a team that prides themselves on having guys with positive wingspans. Um, it, it's a bummer, but Malachi Flynn is just, he's really small. And you see that. And this is his largest role yet. Um, so why are we, why were his minutes down and stuff like that? Like when you just look at it statistic, statistically, why is that a thing? I think it's I think it's if you look at the games, he's just playing in more games. And so the games that he played last season, I'm sure the number's higher because we're only a quarter into the season or or what have you, but his role is larger, his minutes are up. Nick Nurse was not playing Malachi Flynn unless the Raptors were looking to tank. Um that That's fair. season <laughs> would have been would have been it. Um but I, I'm I'm kind of interested in Malachi. So here's the thing about Malachi Flynn. He is really small. Like if he were a bigger guard, maybe there would be a future for him this season. I think the Raptors are really trying to find or try to fit him into things because he is a restricted free agent and they need to know what they have with him. And they just did not have that um last season. Those were Part of Masai Ujiri's comments last year were really, we need to get these young guys more involved because, you know, Nick Nurse runs a Thibodeau rotation in that he's playing eight guys. He is not going 10 deep. And that often meant that guys like Malachi Flynn didn't get to see much playing time. And so um, that was like a real emphasis in the offseason for the Raptors was trying to get the Malachi Flynn's, the Delano Bantons, who's now Boston Celtic, boo, but um, trying to get those guys more involved. And so um, we saw that this year and he's had some moments where he's looked nice. He can hit a three point shot kind of well, but uh, you know, he's a pick and roll guard, but you're not really putting the ball in his hands because he can get stopped so easily. He can just throw traps at him. He's, he's really small. It's really difficult to find a role for him, but I'm kind of interested with like, if there's one coach that can maybe salvage something out of him, it could be a Tom Thibodeau just because of he's had the Jerry Luke, the Jerry Lucas says the John Lucas of thirds. He's yeah. had, <laughs> he's had these like small guards in the past, a DJ Augustine's he's like third point guards in a rotation that can come in and just be the scorer off the bench. He's done it before. Um, and, you know, in his time in Chicago, we've seen it. He's had Earl Watson. He's had John Lucas III. He's had DJ Augustine. There's a bunch more that I'm probably forgetting. Um, and Are you sure he had, he had Nate Robinson at one point? He did. <laughs> um, and so he's he's gotten things out of them. I'm, I'm going to be honest. I think that, like, this is sort of Malachi's last chance. I'm, like, it's – He's a small guard, but he can hit a three, and he's a good pick-and-roll guy, and I think he can maybe come off the bench and, and do some things there. Well, that's why it's so interesting that he is a small guard because he's immediately coming into a position where if he's going to get minutes, it's that he's fighting with Deuce McBride for these minutes because with Emmanuel quickly going out and the Knicks bringing in Malachi Flynn, in essence, as like the replacement guard in the lineup, if you were to assume he would take a rotational role, but he probably is not, it's probably going to be Deuce McBride at this point because literally 12 hours after the trade happens, they give Deuce an extension, three years, yeah. $13 million, which you don't you don't extend a guy that's going to be an RFA for four, even for four million dollars a year, unless you plan on him being your ninth ten, or tenth guy. So, and one thing you're saying about like Tibbs might actually be able to salvage Malachi Flynn. We all know Tibbs actually loves Deuce McBride. He just doesn't think of him as one of his ten best players on his team prior to this because Deuce's main calling card, another small guard. I think he's much shorter than Malachi. I think he's listed at six foot. He might be five eleven. Six foot with shoes on. I will but. say Malachi looks smaller than the guys who are listed as shorter than him. Like not just in height, he's just like he's frail as well. Like he's just maybe they're both five ten. <laughs> <laughs> but Deuce has a long wingspan, and Deuce actually is great at defense. That's his tenacious calling card, and that's why he's actually going to be able to stay in the NBA for a little while. So, do you, if you were to pick, I'm not saying you probably watch a lot of Deuce McBride all the time, but who are you actually expecting to be the second point guard to come off the bench? I would expect it to be Deuce, like okay, over Malachi. Same. I, I, I certainly <clears throat> would, and. I want to be wrong about Malachi. Like I said, if there's maybe a coach that can salvage something, it could very well be Tom Thibodeau. It was not Nick Nurse and it wasn't Darko Rayakovich for the Toronto Raptors. He just did not have a role here. Uh, I don't have it listed as like a topic for us to talk about, but can you give me 90 seconds of how you've liked Coach Darko as an experience so far? Um, he's nice. Um, very, very <laughs> nice. Um, great gowns. It's interesting because 
Nick Nurse is, you know, the greatest coach in Raptors history. He, you know, brought the team a championship, did it in his first year. How off, how rare is that when we look at all these other teams come together? It's really difficult to get something going in year one. Uh, and he was able to do that even with a giant midseason trade. He is um, one of the most creative coaches, I think, in the league. He was only the Raptors head coach for five seasons and still, like, after his first year first season or second season, he had a bunch of his assistant coaches just branch off and get head coaching jobs, right? Because people want a Nick Nurse style coach. So um, so he was great. And he's kind of persnickety. He's okay. kind of- I like the made up word. <laughs> yeah, sure. But you know what I mean when I say it. What was yeah, I yeah. trying to say? Pernick? I don't know. But anyway, so he's he's- <clears throat> will call out his players in the media and they just be like, wait, what? Um, That's not usually a move a rookie coach makes, though. Are you saying Nurse used to? I know Nurse no, used to nurse that. Used to do, I'm nurse I was going to say, I don't think Darko should this be is, doing that. Darko's <laughs> not doing this. I mean, a Nurse did it in year one. <laughs> but um, uh, he was also- Now he's like a top three assistant. coach in the NBA and has a title. So there you go. <laughs> hey, hey, and yeah, and he won that title in year one. So like he yeah. was allowed to do that. <laughs> but I uh, know no, like, Nurse would like call players out in the media. Nurse would just bench like Scotty Barnes, your bench today. Or Gary Trent Jr., your bench today. And it was, it was odd. And so- um, I think that like the players didn't really great get uh a, like there were the vets that I think got along with him, but I think it was like the locker room was a disaster and there was a lot of like personality issues there. And so you move off of that and you get the nicest guy. Like there is, you're going to get a lot of people not saying the nicest things about Nick nurse, but you get the nicest guy in Darko Yankovic, but like, <laughs> all that creative stuff on the court, all that like excellent coaching that you're getting from Nick Nurse is kind of the trade-off. He's almost like the complete 180 of a coach there. And that's not to, to disrespect Darko Ryakovich. It's year one and he's been given a really flawed roster and being asked to make things work. And I think there was a real emphasis on playing a lot of the young guys because Precious and um, Malachi were often out of the lineup with Nick Nurse there. So um he is, he was sort of tasked with a lot, but, um, and the Raptors needed to change their entire flow and their entire offense. So he's been given a huge task. I know he said 90 seconds and I just keep going. I'm just trying to be nice and saying that like, he hasn't been good for the team. <laughs> like, no, I was hoping, that's good. what I was really trying to get you to not say. Not a good, <laughs> yeah. It, it, like I'm just trying to say it in the nicest way possible. It hasn't been a good start, but he's a rookie coach and there's a lot of time left in the season. Following up, like I said, following up with one of the three best coaches of the NBA or following up that regime yeah. is extremely hard to do, especially for a first time ever coach. There, the personality, he's nicer. He yeah, gives them a game day chain every time they win, uh, <laughs> goes to a different player. It's, you know, the vibes are, are smilier, but uh, it's not translating to wins on the court. I really, I feel like that's a great psychological question. Would you rather be happy in a loser or sad in a winner? I mean, they weren't winning in Nick Nurse's final years either. So sad that's, and a loser, happy a loser true. was the option here. I think I lost your audio. Oh, oh you there you go. Yep, you're back. I just have to, uh, thank God this isn't live. I just have to cut, remember to cut that. Um, okay. All right. At the 1830, 1827 mark, I think. Awesome. Okay. So here, let's get back to it. All right. So we'll start, since we started with Malachi Flynn, we'll do Precious Achua and then we'll so go to RJ and IQ and then end with OJ. So okay. Precious Achua, six foot nine, seven foot two wingspan, 24 years old, went five picks before Emmanuel quickly in 2020, which is also why all three of these guys are RFAs because they're all first round picks from the year 2020. University of Memphis, drafted by the Heat, traded to the Raptors in Kyle Lowry deal. Um, rep, repped by, which agents matter to New York, because if it's not CAA, it's always worth noting. He's repped by Raymond Brothers, the same guy who reps Emmanuel quickly for Rock Nation. So that's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so Precious has actually had more of a role this year, like you said, than Nick Nurse, than he was getting with Nick Nurse last year. He's been your guy's primary backup big. Am I wrong? No, you're you're entirely right. And that's because Christian Coloco, who the Raptors drafted to be their backup center, has been out all year with injury. Um, Precious, Precious Achua, though, starting with his time with Nick Nurse when the Raptors traded for him, um, was 
was sort of your your four or five, right? Like he did play a lot of backup big minutes. The Raptors didn't have a center for a long time until they made that Yaka Pirtle trade. Everyone and was six foot nine. <laughs> everyone was six foot nine, including Precious Achua, and he was their nominal five, right? Like he was that guy that they did throw out there. And so the Knicks with Mitch Robinson being out for the season are going to really, I think, need a guy like Precious Achua. I think it makes sense that he's involved in that. I will say this, Precious Achua is um, – one of my favorite players. Like, so when, when the Raptors got him, you know, Masai Jiri went to him and said, like, finally, like, I've been after you for so long. Um, and that's because Precious Achu is one of the most gifted athletes I think I've ever seen. He is a phenomenal athlete and can do so much. And sometimes Precious Achu tries to do all of those things at the same time. And you're like, what are you doing? Um, so he can be the most exciting player that you get. And he can also be the most frustrating player you'll get. In reality, he just hasn't been able to make it work in his first three years. Um, and so I didn't I didn't expect the Raptors to want to extend him next season because it has been so on and off and up and down with him. And the down has been much longer than the positive ups um, like in his first year with the Raptors. And maybe he can sort of replicate that with New York because his first year here in Toronto was phenomenal um, and it's been downhill ever since. And so hopefully you can get that back in New York. I think if you put him in a role and in that he's not being asked to do too much. Um, you can get a really good player because he is so incredibly athletic. He's so incredibly gifted. Uh, defensively, he said this at the start of the year that he can guard one through five. And, you know, he's not OG Ananobi, but he certainly, you know, I thought at points that the Raptors would trade OG and then put Precious Achua in that role. I really did believe that that would be the role that he would be stepping into for the Toronto Raptors as their most versatile defender, uh, you know, big wing guy. But it didn't pan out because of Precious just – there's a lot there. He just has not tapped into all of it, uh, and there will be moments where you see it and moments where you don't. That's why Heat fans were so high on him, and then we're like, no, get, get him away. <laughs> and Raptor fans, again, super high on him, and then you have that crash. Uh, hopefully, you know, the third time's a charm for him. Precious Achua reminds me, let me know if I'm off base with this, but he reminds me a lot of Kenneth Fareed, and I'm worried about him having the Kenneth Fareed like, career arc. You know what I mean? Where you start out really hot, and then you actually taper off, and you leave the league like five to ten year, five to seven years prior than your age would suggest. Am I wrong there? I think Kenneth Fareed was more gifted offensively, and Precious Achua is just heads and shoulders more gifted defensively. But I can see what you're saying in terms of like, hey, we all expect so much from this guy. And then you see the sort of crash and burn and he's out of the league. And just like a six foot eight, six foot nine athletic freak that could play three through five, but can't really shoot from anywhere. Right, right. But like to me, hopefully um, that's not pressure to his future just because he can be so good defensively. And Kenneth Fury just was he was, a re- he, was, he was a rebounder. He wasn't trying to <laughs> yeah, defend. <laughs> he, was, he was horrendous on that end. And so, like, there, there is the bones for Precious to be a good basketball player there. Also, he was starting to make strides, especially in his first year with the Raptors. If you look at, you know, from January onwards, um, in his first year with Toronto, he was shooting, like, 40% from deep. So, like, if you get that, Precious at you, uh, oh, he's golden. But um, when you get the 20% three-point shooter who wants to take a bunch and or wants to put the ball on the floor and you're like, what are you doing? That's not your rule. <laughs> Uh, it can be more frustrating, but I think if he has like a really hard, uh, you know, role and just plays that plays within that, he can have a long career in the NBA. We just haven't seen him be able to put that together. Well, for this, I mean, I, I honestly take this for this for him as a tryout period because he's going to yeah. have a defined role coming to New York immediately. Isaiah Hart signs the starter. Precious Achua, even with him uh, going through struggles this year, is leaps and bounds better than 38 year old Taj Gibson and is much more, it's much better and more polished than Jericho. I can jump over a car, but not do much else since. So he's immediately coming into a role where he's getting 13 to 18 minutes a game behind Isaiah Hartenstein, sometimes a little bit more if I Hart actually gets in the foul trouble, which he's still one to do. I would say one every like two or three weeks. Yeah. So that's good for him to have the tryout. And then, I hearts a I hearts an uh, unrestricted free agent at the end of the year. Mitchell Robinson is ideally, hopefully coming back. I think that Mitch might actually come back this year, but it's an entirely Ooh. different thing. You don't be as entirely. Um, no, this is slightly off base. The pressure that you would think for the disabled players exemption, you have to be fully decided by an independent arbitrator of by the NBA, not by the Knicks or the team. That you're not going. You're going to be out by June fifteenth. Mitchell Robinson had an eight to ten week surgery on December fifteenth. I don't. Last yeah. I checked calendar math that's not 10 weeks it's like six months so i think he's gonna be back okay 
I, I hope so. I hope so for the Knicks' sake. And I, you know what? I think it's going to be really fun uh, to see if if Tibbs just goes with Taj and you're like, Precious is sitting right there. It'll just be a fun experiment to watch. What? Oh, my God. If he plays Taj Gibson over Precious Achua outside of maybe today, it might be going insane in New there York. Is, there is like a, a physical difference between them that is as wide as their basketball IQ. Not to like disrespect Precious Achua, smart guy, but on the basketball court, tries to do things that are not um, not conducive to winning. Well, Taj Gibson's still in the league solely because of his basketball IQ at this point. He's it has nothing to do with his ability yeah. anymore. He's, he's one of the smartest, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I do think this is going to be a trial for both Precious and iHeart to see. I think the Knicks keep one of them next year. Can you keep Precious for cheaper than iHeart's going to get? Because iHeart's probably going to get like 15 to 20 mil starter money. Mm-hmm. Or does Precious not work out and you have to end up overpaying to rationalize keeping Mitch and iHeart together one more year or trade one of those two? So it's going to be really fun to see. I hope Precious Achua works out. Me and too. I love Precious. He I does not that. have a Kenneth Fareed career arc. <laughs> I, I love Precious. I know I've been kind of hard on him. Uh it's been a rough season, but um, I, I do love Precious. I think you know, if he can put it together, if only. His biggest two drops statistically were his field goal percentage went from 49 to 46, even though he's not. it's not the three-point thing because it's like yeah, at 29%. It's been at yeah. 29%, and he doesn't take them. But why is his free throw shooting down 13 percent points from one year to the next? Because the entire Raptors team, uh, I, I, I did this. I did this for, for Yahoo earlier this year. Um, that's a Raptor-wide issue. Um, that's something that needs to be figured out. It's somewhere in the waters. OG at one point was shooting 40% from the free throw line or 44% from the free throw line, and that's gone up. But um, when I did that, that's that was his, and he, he wasn't even the worst on the team. It was Gary Trent Jr., who, what? Like, then your role is to shoot. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, it was just a team-wide issue all season. Okay. So, well, I mean, thankfully he's not doing that anymore. Although I, OJ and Anobi being a little worse might've been what made this trade actually go through with this, this price. Cause you guys didn't get a first round pick out of all this. And I know you said you didn't believe the three first round picks last year to not get one is even though the 31st pick is almost there, still kind of crazy. So I'm on, let's go to, let's get into the Raptor side. So you guys got RJ better and Emmanuel quickly in this trade. Emmanuel quickly fills a giant need immediately. So we'll talk about him second. Where do you think RJ Barrett fits in this current Raptor model? Because RJ Barrett in New York was a guy that struck, kind of struggled up and down being the third guy with the ball. You're behind Jalen Brunson. You're behind Julius Randle. He's going to Toronto. You're behind Pascal Siakam. You're behind Scotty Barnes. You might actually just be behind Emmanuel quickly because now the Raptors aren't married to you being the third overall pick. You guys are just together on a package deal. And IQ is there as the need. You're there as the throw in. So RJ Bear's points have gone down the past three years. Uh, his field goal percentage is up, but all of his other shooting splits are basically down. He had a terrible defending season last year. He's better. He's being better defensively this year, a little more switchable, but you lost OG and Anobi. That is like comparing a mansion to a apartment complex. So not quite the same thing there. Where do you first two things is RJ Bear going to start for you guys slash close for you guys. And where is RJ Barrett? in the league in two years is he still in the toronto raptors or is he somewhere else again it's a really good question i um masai you know the, the joke is that he doesn't make those trades but he's not married to players he doesn't draft um so he is uh really fine flipping flipping guys that he's just sort of brought over um like yaga a player that he did draft he went and traded back for him after giving yeah. him up he's married to the players he drafts and then might trade him and again then- <laughs> They might and they might trade him again and they might trade back for him in a bit. <laughs> but um I I that's a really good question about is he still on those Raptors team? Because that's something that I've been thinking about a lot. And I, I think you mentioned it. The Raptors are not married to him being the third overall pick. There aren't these lofty expectations. He's not gonna come in having disappointed for not developing this, like, you know, we, we want him to be a guy who can create for himself and all these other things. The Raptors don't expect any of that from RJ Barrett. He's going to have a role, as you mentioned, behind. And I think you're right. I think it's going to also be behind quickly. I think he's going to be your fourth uh, option there. And the Raptors also, who knows what is going to happen to Pascal Siakam and what players he can turn into. Because it seems like the Raptors are not interested in getting picks back, which is something I've been saying this entire time. It's not about picks. Masai Ujiri um, has been, and this is a piece that I'm not a tanker. He's not a tanker. He's uh, this is a piece that I'm going to put out. It's just like a, a quick preview of it, which is Masai Ujiri has been at the helm of three different rebuilds. Uh, you know, Carmelo Anthony leaving Denver, and he was like, 
I like in that package back he really wanted to get those players. Like maybe this is a tough spot for the Knicks, but it was the Wilson Chandlers, the Danilo Gallinari's, the players who can, the, the Denver Nuggets were a 57 win team the year after. So Jerry was like, we're not going to take, that is not what rebuilding is. Rebuilding is I had this construction and I'm tearing that construction down to build up another building. That is what my rebuild is, but it's not to just bottom out and get as many picks as possible, which is why those three first round picks that were going to have a ton of different protections on them, who knows when they would have conveyed. Now you have to develop all of those guys to fit around Scotty Barnes, who looks like he's ready to compete today. Um, it just would have taken too long. It wouldn't have made sense. That's not how the Raptors have ever operated. The second rebuild, again, Rudy Gay, when that trade happened, there was no first round pick that came back in that package. It was a bunch of bench players, and that took a team that was 6-13 and 13 and made them finish with a 48 or 49 win record like it was they were playing at a 50 some odd win pace after they got those pieces back because Masai has never prioritized getting those first round picks instead he's always wanted players in return who can compete young players last year when all of the talk about the first round picks came out I think it was Doug Smith of the Toronto Star who said Raptors are looking for two promising young players and what did they get in return a 23 year old and a 24 year old who were promising young players maybe rj barrett hasn't materialized you know into the star that nick's fans had hoped for and i don't know if he ever will i'm going to be honest i've never been particularly high on rj barrett but um i think his role in toronto is going to be much different i think the expectations are going to be much different um no one's looking to have him sort of create or do anything i think he's going to sort of start I think he's got to start the Raptors don't have a lot of players and this OG trade to me is a win because they traded one rotation player sorry to Malachi Flynn and, and Precious Jua for two rotation players in RJ Barrett and uh, Emmanuel Kifley that should both be starting day one so you're saying that RJ Barrett's most likely going to start from day one why is he going to start over Gary Trent Jr and do you expect him to be finishing over Gary Trent Jr because I as a Knicks fan we can tell you RJ Barrett doesn't allow spacing and if he's not going to be the first or second by to be touching the ball and trying to create or do anything whether it's for himself or kicking out which i'm gonna let you know it's mostly for himself he doesn't look to kick out too too often um are you expecting him to be in the finishing lineup or would you think do you think it's going to be gary trent instead i'm never sort of married to the idea of like one sort of finishing lineup um, nick nurse has always and maybe this is just nick nurse time but like um He's always it's always been way more malleable and flexible based off of the game and, and what the matchups are. Um, I don't expect him to start over Gary Trent Jr. I expect him to start over Dennis Schroeder. Um, I think uh, you put in Emmanuel quickly and you put in um, you put in RJ Barrett and Dennis Schroeder is your sixth man off the bench. Um, so the lineup would essentially be Emmanuel quickly. RJ Barrett's uh, whatever. Uh, who am I missing? Scotty Barnes, Pascal Siakam, Jakob Pertle. Who am I missing? Oh, Gary Trent Jr.'s are two. Okay. Right, so right. Emmanuel quickly, Gary Trent Jr., uh, Scotty Barnes, Pascal Siakam, Jakob Pertle. That's who I would imagine be the Raptors starting five. Okay. And then so RJ is coming off the bench then. R would you say no, like RJ? R RJ was my four. No? Was my no, no, no. You had uh, it's IQ, oh. Gary Trent, Scotty. That's the thing. Scotty and RJ are really the ones that are like uh, crossing over. Scotty, Pascal, Jakob Pertle. So that's what I mean. Is like that's what. So I think it is Gary Trent or R.J. Barrett. Yeah, because it is. IQ I, and Scotty are locked I in. I forgot that OG is is who we're okay. Um. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I would put want, want more shooting in there. I think I I would start Gary Trent Jr. over R.J. Barrett, but also Gary Trent Jr. has been struggling a little bit on and off. I wouldn't be married to any sort of starting rotation right now. But yeah, I think you need the shooting in there. So get Gary Trent Jr. would start. Never mind. Okay, that's fair. And then let's so let's talk about the guy that you guys in essence really traded for and were traded for the rights for. It is Emmanuel Quickly more so than RJ Barrett. Emmanuel Quickly, who was averaging almost 16 points a game, I think it actually hit 16 points a game the last game because he got another 22 points in 21 minute outing. Thank as as Knicks fans, we just got so accustomed to that this year that it really he's a fan favorite. RJ yeah. RJ has stands. Emmanuel Quickly was a fan favorite. Whether you loved or loved the team, you were like an anti Nick fan. Like IQ was like beheld by the fan base. So losing him is really, really hard. You guys are going to love him because you guys need floor spacing, especially at the one Dennis Schroeder. I'm sorry. This isn't FIBA. Um, but so IQ is the guy you guys got. What are you most excited about? And then what are you concerned about with him stepping into his first real starting role? Honestly, I am so excited for IQ. And like, maybe um, 
maybe an unhealthy amount. <laughs> like <laughs> I spent a large part of my New Year's Eve watching IQ highlights. Um, and I, to me, the Raptors, as you said, it definitely need the spacing. You need the pull-up shooting. You just, the, the Raptors have needed their guard of the future. I think his fit alongside Scotty Barnes, who's another big playmaker, just makes so much sense to me. It's just the long-term fit of them together, regardless of what happens with Pascal Siakam this season, regardless of, you know, who else comes back in a deal. I think you have a good core. And I think, I think RJ Barrett is included in that. He can be moved at any point. I, I don't think anyone's sort of married to him being there, but he's only 23 years old. Um, we've seen flashes from him. I think that his role here is going to be different than it was in New York and that there are the same expectations on him. He's not even seen as the piece to come back. It's IQ. That's the piece to come back. So, um, to me, it's just with Emmanuel quickly. I know the size is an issue. I know we've seen, you know, the, his playoffs last year were an issue. But, like, I don't – I'm not, like – I'm not worried about any of that just yet. I think we need to see him in a starting role. And, you know, Blake Murphy of Sportsnet here in Canada uh, wrote a piece earlier this year talking about what type of players the Raptors sort of need, uh, who can be their, you know – not to say that, you know, uh, IQ is Halliburton, but who can be that sort of star young player that you get, you give him a bigger role and you see what he can become. And to me, IQ fit that mold. IQ was one of the players that he mentioned in there and he was the only one that I was like, yep, him, I want him on my team uh, versus the other people that were mentioned in the piece. Um, and I'm just, I'm excited to see what he can become. I know we're supposed to temper expectations, but like the season sucks. So why not uh, <laughs> just get delusional really high about a player coming back to the team? And that's how I feel about IQ. And I know size is an issue, but like at 6'3", he might be the tallest starting point guard for the Raptors in since before Kyle Lowry, since Jose Calderon. <laughs> Jose might have been 6'3 as well. Yeah, so he he's like 6'3. He, so it's the same. He might have been the tallest starting point guard for the Raptors since who was before that? TJ Ford. Also, not that big. It might be 20 years that we're going back when we talk <laughs> about a starting point guard for the Toronto Raptors that is bigger than IQ, you know, as we call him small. Oh my god, that's actually really funny to think about. Who's the tallest Toronto Raptors point guard? Not, not an extra under thought. six feet tall. Kyle Lowry listed at six feet five eleven. Um, <laughs> five eleven at best on a good day. Um, yeah, it's just you go back. There's there, he might be the in twenty years. That might be a thing. I'd have to go back and think about it like longer, but I can't think of one. Um, yeah, that's so no. funny. Yeah, Jared Jack, not tall. No. So I ha I do have to ask you a question. I'm hoping I'm not like ruin your hopes and dreams right here, but. How worried are you that like the Spurs and or the Magic, most likely the Spurs are just going to offer this dude the max or like offer him like 28, 30 mil at the end of the season. And then this ends up being a, a rental for you guys versus like a long-term pairing. Uh, because he's a restricted free agent, I'm not that worried about any of that because um, the Raptors just need to pay their guys. They need to have guys. I'm not worried about the Raptors not matching anything. Like I, I know everyone's talking about Raptors need picks and all this other stuff. Another sort of like, tidbit in this is the Raptors ownership group doesn't just own the team they own the tv networks that we watch this on imagine if like I know, I know like MSG TV and all this other stuff. I was going to say, you're talking to the wrong fan base. Any other fan base, I got it. I get that, but like, I'm talking nationwide, right? Yeah. Like, they own Sportsnet, which is equivalent to, and TSN, which is equivalent to our ESPN. ESPN, like, yeah. It's like, and our newspapers also owned by the Raptors <laughs> uh, ownership group. Uh, so our radio stations, the, the sports channels, our sports channels also owned by them, our television networks. So like if I turn on cable to watch a game, the cable that I'm paying for also owned by the Raptors ownership group. So relevance is so important to the Raptors in a way that I don't think it is for any other team. So the idea that they're just not going to pay guys in order to get a bunch of picks and bottom out doesn't quite vibe with this team considering they just need relevance because our cable, our TV networks, our newspapers, all of that is owned by the Raptors ownership group. That's fair. And quickly is going to be a fan favorite and he's going to attract a lot of new young fans. So I think it's, he's going to help them with ratings for sure. Yeah, you just, I don't know if you're a baseball fan, but you just actually reminded me why the Mets sucked to the Braves for like, 20 years of my life because the Braves and own Turner broadcasting station. That's like who their owners have been. And I'm okay. like, Oh, so that's what's like when a team is owned by a cable company and they get money for being good all the time. They try to be good all the time. And then if you have an owner that gets money from people showing up and then he has other ventures that don't matter with ratings, 
they do that. Like James Dolan cares more about the sphere right now than he does the Knicks and Rangers. And the Knicks and Rangers are both good. So I mean, yeah. Yeah. there you go. Yeah. So I'm on, let's get to my favorite part. Because I know I remember telling you this at the beginning of the season. OG Ananobi was my favorite non-Nick in the whole NBA for like yeah. two or three years. And now he's actually a Nick. And I might be one of the only people on Nick's social media that is super duper excited, 100%. Think this is an A-plus trade because they got OG. They got a backup big and they didn't give up a first-round pick. And anyone that loves Emmanuel quickly and every RJ stand I've ever talked to thinks I'm delusional. So let's get into the guy who is one of the two best perimeter defenders in the NBA. And the guy that's really, in essence, the best player in this deal, barring Emmanuel quickly becoming a real, real all-star in the future. OG Ananobi's numbers have been down a little bit this year. I know you started off the top of the podcast with that and like saying like he might be checked out. It might be an injury thing. I'm hoping it's just checked out because he has looked a little, he looks like he turns it on when he has a matchup he cares about. And then he looks like he turns it off otherwise. So what should Knicks fans that don't know OG be most excited about to see? Oh my goodness. I love OG so much. And I, I genuinely do believe that he was Masai Jiri's most prized uh, player. Um, he is. I don't want to cut you off. Can I ask you a question based on that? Yeah. How surprised are you that he was the one dealt before or instead of Pascal then? No, I, I thought that that would happen. It only makes sense to happen because I don't think OG was going to stay a Toronto Raptor. And uh, you can, you can extend Pascal. Right. Like Pascal can get an extension. OG was never going to get an extension because he can just the raises are so much bigger if you were to sign in the offseason. And the Raptors couldn't risk going into the offseason um, with Pascal not signed on long. I'm with the OG not signed on long term, whereas with Pascal, you can extend it at any point. It's fine. OK, that makes that's fair. It's but just yeah, like cap situation. Gotcha. OK, that makes sense. Also, again, the CAA thing, it just seemed like I mean, him saying he's willing to take less to stay with the Knicks. I'm pretty sure yeah. it's because you can make some Times Square money with CAA. Versus you can't do that with any other agency in any other area, except for Clutch in LA, which, I mean, different thing. <laughs> Same thing, but different thing. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. The most no. exciting thing Knicks fans have for OG and Anobi. Uh OG is one of the most versatile defenders in the NBA. Um, he might be the most versatile defender in the NBA. The Raptors throw him out on their main guy this entire time. I know a large part of Nick Nurse's philosophy for so long was just stop the superstar and how they were able to do that. It's nice to have a philosophy, but it's impossible to execute if you don't have a player like OG Ananobi. I'm talking Luca one night, Donovan Mitchell another night, Kevin Durant, Victor Wimbanyama, um, Nikola Jokic. He was our Nikola Jokic guy. He can guard one through five. Um, you want What's him less. What's Yaka even there for, honestly? <laughs> this is before Yaka was here. Before Yaka was here, that's what he did. Even in, like, the, you know, the bubble when the Raptors were about to get swept by the Boston Celtics, the change was we're going small with OG Ananobi at the five. Now, he's not, like, a rim protector. You don't want him to be your five. There's a reason why the Raptors desperately, desperately needed Yaka last year is because uh, he you need a big behind him. Uh, he is, you know, a perimeter defender primarily but he can just you can get him on anybody and if you look up his numbers I mean this is a thing that Raptor fans have been doing like look up what he's done when guarding Donovan Mitchell like I think in at least last season I don't know what the numbers were this year it was like Donovan Mitchell's worst game yep happened against OG Ananobi the least amount of shots that, that uh Luka Doncic has taken in a game both those games yep happened against <laughs> the Toronto Raptors because of OG Ananobi like you can just sort of look at it he is the the superstar stopper I, like I like I don't want to exaggerate his defense, but I think not talking about it in this way is underselling it. He is that good defensively, and he has not been that this season. And I think it's really hard to be that this season consistently when, you know, behind you, someone's just going to let someone go by for a layup. And you're just like, what have I been doing all of this work for when the rest of my team is not up to par? So that's where I say, like, maybe it's been an injury that makes him a step slow. Maybe it's a little bit of him being checked out, but he is just – everything and more that you can want defensively and on the offensive end he is not a guy who can create for himself he's not a guy who can uh you know really get his own offense but he is a phenomenal spot up shooter he is one of the best corner three-point shooters in the league and consistently has been that for the past few years he's also a phenomenal cutter he's just sort of the the glue that makes an offense work for the Raptors he was often their glue that made everything work on offense because he didn't need the ball in his hands like some of the other guys do in order to get theirs um 
but he was, you know, the vision six, nine, he was the best floor spacer of the bunch and the best defender of the bunch, which made it all work. So yeah, if you're looking for that third star, if you think that he's, you know, Julius Randle, OG Ananobi and Jalen Brunson, you're not going to get that from OG and that he shouldn't have the ball in his hands and be asked to create a ton. That's not his role, even though he's reportedly wanted that role. He's just not been able to do that. Um, but he is a phenomenal spot up shooter. Um, you know, his footwork has gotten a lot better. He's a lot better inside this season. I think that's been an underrated element of his game this year that he didn't he's even bigger have. Too. It looks like he's like 10 to 15 pounds heavier. He is, big. Yeah, he is, he is bigger. He's in, he, yeah, he can bully guys down low, but his footwork has also gotten much better. Uh, his finishing has also gotten much better. His control has gotten much better. And I think that's an underrated part of his game that a lot of people aren't talking about because it hasn't been a staple of his game in years prior, but it, you saw it this year before the sort of drop off came. Um, but yeah, so on, on offense, don't expect to get, you know, like the RJ Barrett role, but imagine if you had that with three point shooting, like imagine if you had that with like a 44% three-point shooter from the corners. And he's also, he's not going to want the ball in his hands. He's not going to try to do too much. He understands his role and he plays within it. So you're not having to worry about him. Like you don't have to worry about him <sighs> just chewing it up, right? Like yeah. precious, you got to worry about that a little bit with OG. He's not going to be that guy. Um, the vast majority of his shots are assisted on the vast majority of his shots come from the corners. The vast majority of his shots are just sort of, you know, catch and shoot threes and they go in and they work. But when he's, but he can also, he's got a little bit of a post-up game. It's not very good. If you look at the numbers, it's not there, but I think it's getting better. Uh, Cause I mentioned inside, he has just, he's looked bigger and his footwork is better. So you're just, you're getting a better player. Like, Oh, geez, great. He's phenomenal. Um, but more importantly, I think he's just like the piece that makes, you know, Donovan Mitchell or someone else work. <laughs> 100 percent yeah i mean donovan mitchell and jante murray have the they're what's it called when you're oh trending they're trending they're tre words, yeah keywords of skyrocketed he makes, them, on he makes them work he's not the star he's not that sort of third star that you need there but he's the piece that's going to make it all work without him it's just like all right you're the phoenix suns i don't know yeah one thing i'm excited about that because i'm because i've been following him for so long and now that he's actually in nick's like social media like attention yeah immediately just like the next like the next timberwolves are in the next game it's happening in a couple hours it'll be it'll already happened when everyone listens to this it just immediately was like anthony anthony edwards last night played og two for ten three turnovers or something like that i'm like seeing that knowing that's going to show up for every single first game he has against xyz superstar just it helps me so much and as an outsider perspective or someone that's not a knicks fan does it hurt you a little bit to, I mean, looking at the Knicks and Raptors, they're kind of similar teams. The Knicks are just like kind of better, but they like, mm -hmm. if you looked at their rosters next to each other, it's like, they kind of line up. There's no Jalen Brunson on the Raptors, but everything else yeah. kind of seems like there's a guy for guy. It was like Scotty Barnes, RJ Barrett, yeah. uh, Pascal Siakam, Julius Randle, Mitchell Robinson, Yakim Pertle, you know what I mean? So seeing that OG is now on a team with Jalen Brunson, like with an actual top tier point guard, with Julius Randle, who attracts double teams inside, I would say more so than Pascal Siakam because more of the bully ball versus Pascal's more of yeah. a finesse guy. You're more likely to double the guy that's strong than you are to guy to double the guy that's trying to do a pull up. Are you kind of jealous that you think OG is going to get more open looks, or does that not bother you too much? You know what? It's kind of nice that you want to chip with OG. You're like, all right, fine. You can go find greener pastures <laughs> while we're in this sort of confusing area. I think um, it's just fair. You guys took IQ, so. <laughs> and, and true yeah I'm, I'm i'm more like to me i'm not jealous about it just because i really love og and i just want him to excel and exceed and he can't do that with this raptors team it doesn't make sense and this raptors team needs a guy like iq so to me i'm happy with this deal i i prefer this than the three protected first round picks that are going to be in the 20s and um aren't going to play for a while and you know won't develop by the time scotty's like 27 <laughs> whatever which is too late because if scotty barnes is going to be a future i think he is a future all-star for sure it might be yeah. starting next year not this year but i think he's bound to happen so yeah he needs to have he needs to have the runway i know we talked about it earlier i know you talked about it with a lot of people like the barnes pascal og thing just never seemed like it would ever fully work the same way the knicks or tibbs thought that iq and brunson can never fully work so i mean even if you have great players part of it's based on roster construction yeah yeah the raptors needed a point guard and they could not figure that one out. Um, they got a center way too late um, because they thought that those three guys could just play five. And because all three of those guys, well, two of those three guys, not OG, um, can play make, they thought they maybe didn't need that point guard. But no, it turns out you need a point guard and you need a center in, in basketball. And that is lessons the Raptors learned too late. And now OG's gone.
I would actually think those are the two most important positions yeah. to fill out as like a direct role. And then two, three, and four are more interchangeable. But you don't get vision six, nine. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. You don't. You know what you don't do? You don't cover Mitchell Robinson when you're six foot nine either. <laughs> Amon, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Uh, last question I have for you, then I'll let you go. Um, mm -hmm. What is your expectation for both the Knicks and the Raptors for the rest of the season? Ooh, um, for the Knicks, I expect another trade. I This can't be the sort of standalone. I don't know if it happens this year. It'd be nice if it did so that they can sort of get everything to work before they have to pay OG his next contract, see what that all looks like. Um, but to me, the Knicks are, are a trade away from like really making that push. Um, and then for the Raptors, they're also a trade away from deciding what they want to do. It's so hard to answer the Raptors portion of the question because Pascal Siakam is a much bigger domino than OG Ananobi. As much as I love OG, that doesn't change as much as like what happens to Pascal Siakam, who is still the team's best player. If you were to put a, a percentage on it, what do you think the odds are Pascal stays or goes? I really think what's going to happen is um, it's I, I sort of likened it to the Carmelo Anthony trade. Sorry to keep bringing that one up. But, um, it was a big one. It's okay. it was, uh, but I, you know, he's again, an expiring player who might not be here. Obviously the Raptors, there's no scenario under the sun where they're going to get the package in return that Denver got for Carmelo Anthony under any circumstance. That's just never going to happen. But what I think is the Raptors are trying to do right now is trying to pit some teams against each other, trying to create competition like Masai Ujiri did with the Knicks and the Nets uh, in order to extract as much as possible. Um, and so that's what I think you're seeing right now with the Dallas news and the Atlanta and Indiana and the Kings and all these other teams that are being mentioned right now just trying to create a bidding war but um if Masai doesn't find what he's looking for then I think Pascal gets extended so right now I think the plan is to trade him however if Masai doesn't seem doesn't feel like hey I'm not generate like what I'm trying to do isn't working in the way that I want it to work then I think Pascal stays so I would put it at um 60 percent he's traded 40 percent he stays so I was a coin flip. It's not, it's not too bad. I thought you were going to say maybe like 70, likely. 30, maybe 70, 30. That's, that's, that's what I was thinking. That's fair. Um, last thing. And then you can totally be free. Enjoy your uh, new year's. I want to let you know real quick because this all reminded me. I made a video that I'm releasing for all of our social media in a little bit that my actual scenario for how the season's going to end up is that the Knicks end up in the seven seed. Mm. The Raptors end up in the 10 seed Ooh. and then the Knicks lose game one. The Raptors win game one. And then they mm. play each other at the garden. And then Knicks fans have to deal with Emmanuel quickly or RJ Barrett ripping their hearts out as of Raptors, which I is, love it. Yeah. I hope script writing is not real. Cause it just seems like it's right on the wall. If it is, <laughs> I love it. I'll take it. I, I figured you would. Amon, <laughs> thank you so much again. Happy new year. Plug anything you want to plug and we'll get out of here. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, do check out that Dishes and Dimes podcast with Tim Donahue if you want to know a ref sauce. We also just like had a ref on there, so we just started asking, like, what do you do at halftime? Like, just <laughs> random questions that like you want to know. Like, how often do you guys get your eyes checked? Things like that were asking <laughs> um, because I just wanted like I'm like I I realize there are bigger things to talk about with Tim Donahue, but also when am I going to ask a referee these questions? Um, so those things were were all asked. Um, and then, um, I also will have a piece coming out about this trade on pros and claws. So check that out as well. Awesome. You know where to find her at Iman Adon. There's an underscore in between the first and the last name. Uh, find me at Joe Yoke, J O E Y O number one K big Nick energy.com. Go there for all your sick and fun New York Knicks merch. There's a bunch of RJ Barrett and Emmanuel quickly things that we're going to be taking down soon. So if you do want to get any of it, now's the time to go on there. Let's go Knicks. Let's not lose to the Raptors in the play in and have a happy new year. Peace.